Ever wondered how the iconic Gladys Knight at the age of 80 is living a life that's nothing short of shocking? Stay tuned. This one's going to leave you absolutely speechless. A musical legend. Born on May 28, 1944 in Atlanta, Georgia, she was destined for greatness from the start. The daughter of Merrill Woodlow Knight Sr., a postal worker, and Sarah Elizabeth Woods, Gladys grew up alongside her sister Brenda and brothers Merrill Jr. and the late David. Her talent, however, became apparent at a young age. At just seven years old in 1952, Gladys Knight captured the spotlight by winning Ted Max the original Amateur Hour TV show contest. Little did the world know that this was just the beginning of a remarkable career that would span decades. Gladys rose to prominence during the late 1960s and early 1970s as the lead of Gladys Knight and the Pips, a family music group hailing from Atlanta, Georgia. In an era when family groups were popular, the Pips stood out thanks to Gladys' distinctive vocal style and her ability to lead the ensemble. The Pips didn't just enjoy popularity, they reached extraordinary heights, scoring a number one hit with the timeless Midnight Train to Georgia in 1973. As a pivotal figure in Motown and soul music, Gladys Knight's contribution to R&B is unparalleled. Over almost four decades of recording and touring, the group garnered accolades and achieved significant milestones. However, the music industry's demands took their toll Pressures to maintain success, fulfill record label obligations, and navigate the unpredictable nature of a musical career led to the bittersweet decision to disband the family group. For Gladys, it marked the end of an era, but her determination to reinvent herself was unwavering. In the realm of the cool continuum, Gladys Knight stands out as an exemplar of the artisan level. Her incredible talent was honed over years of dedication to her craft. Yet, the music industry, with all its demands, ultimately prompted the family band to bid farewell. It was a turning point for Gladys, but far, far from the end. In 1952, Gladys, alongside her brother Merrill, sister Brenda, and cousins William and Eleanor Guest, embarked on a musical adventure by forming a group named The Pips, an homage to another cousin, James Pip Woods. As the years unfolded, their musical journey gained momentum. By the end of the 1950s, The Pips hit the road, showcasing their talents on stages across the country. However, changes were on the horizon. Brenda Knight and Eleanor Guest made way for Gladys's cousin Edward Patton and friend Langston George. The shift marked a turning point, and after the release of their first single, Every Beat of My Heart, the group underwent a transformation, rebranding themselves as Gladys Knight and the Pips in 1961. The early 1960s witnessed the departure of Langston George, and a significant moment came in 1962 when Gladys Knight decided to step away from the limelight to start a family. However, the pull of the music proved too strong, and she rejoined the Pips in 1964. Their journey continued, and over the years, they etched their names in the annals of music history. The Pips, a powerhouse ensemble, remained a force until their eventual split in 1989. Tragically, health challenges took a toll on the group. Edward Patton, diagnosed with diabetes, succumbed to the disease in February 2005. William Guest faced congestive heart failure, leading to his passing in 2015. In 1997, Eleanor Guest, an original member of the Pips, passed away from heart failure. As part of Gladys Knight and the Pips, Gladys delivered memorable hits like Midnight Train to Georgia, I Heard It Through the Grapevine and Neither One of Us, showcasing the group's versatility and unmatched talent. In 1989, Gladys took a solo detour. In 1989, Gladys took a solo detour to record the theme music for the James Bond movie License to Kill, further solidifying her status as a musical icon. The Misunderstood Talent of Gladys Knight in 1972, the world witnessed Gladys Knight and the Pips in a memorable performance on the television show Soul. The stage was set, and the air was thick with anticipation as they delved into their repertoire of hits. One such standout was If I Were Your Woman, a poignant ballad where Knight, draped in a low-cut, ankle-length purple dress and a matching bow adorned her princess-style hairdo, gave a performance to remember. As the Pips, impeccably dressed in cream-colored turtlenecks and dark suits, Provided the musical backdrop, Knight took center stage, declaring, You're like a diamond. Her pointed finger reached towards the sky, a visual cue for the glimmer of the metaphorical diamond. 
The lyrics unfolded a narrative where she tells a man involved with someone else that he deserves better, asserting, yet you beggar to love you, ha, but me, you don't ask. Far from being upset, Knight danced, navigating the constraints of the small stage and sent vocal fireworks echoing with a soulful, if I were your woman, woo. The performance was a testament to Knight's undeniable presence and vocal prowess. However, despite their extraordinary talent, Gladys Knight and the Pips have found themselves more beloved by fans than duly recognized by music historians. The landscape of pop music history often leads towards celebrating individuals over groups, creating a hierarchy where some, like Sam Cooke and Patti LaBelle, overshadow the collective brilliance of groups they were once part of. Gladys Knight and the Pips challenge the simplicity of this narrative. They don't neatly fit into the binary of Motown entertainers versus unapologetically black conscious artists. Their breakthrough, not in the protest anthems of the time, but in advancing a wholesome yet gender progressive image of pro-black excellence. In 1973, the stage was set for Gladys Knight and the Pips to release their monumental hit, Midnight Train to Georgia. Even as critics like Phil Garland from Ebony hailed them as the best soul group of the day performing at its peak, the group already stood as something of a throwback in an industry evolving towards a sober, cerebral aesthetic. Amidst the changing landscape, Gladys Knight and the Pips were a testament to longevity and unity. While other singing groups disbanded, they stayed together, a testament to the values instilled by their legendary trainer, choreographer, Charlie Atkins. In an era dominated by the likes of Roberta Flack and Gil Scott Heron, known for their serious and cerebral approach, Gladys Knight and the Pips exuded genuine joy on stage, an infectious happiness that set them apart. The group's origins trace back to a birthday party in Atlanta in 1952, where a young Gladys, along with her brother Merrill, sister Brenda, and cousins Eleanor and William Guest, formed the foundation of what would become a legendary musical journey. Mark Anthony Neal, a scholar, aptly described Knight as the female voice of the black working class in the 1970s, highlighting her grounded presence compared to the divine Aretha Franklin and glamorous Diana Ross. Their commitment to black solidarity and longevity wasn't just a stylistic choice, but a functional one. Merrill Knight expressed their hope to show young black kids, and some of the older ones too, an opportunity to see a black organization stay together throughout its lifespan. In terms of gender politics, Gladys Knight and the Pips broke norms with three dancing men supporting a powerhouse front woman. Knight, with her rough, textured voice reminiscent of Tina Turner, presented herself in a more subdued manner. Unlike Ike Turner's exploitative role as Tina's husband, Pimp, the Pips acted as amiable bouncers, complimenting Knight's allure rather than overshadowing it. Rooted in the Baptist church, Knight's voice carried the mark of her upbringing, characterized by raspy, textured tones. However, unlike elaborate gospel melismas or ad-libs, her style was more about efficient expression of heart. Knight's creative and professional ambition shone through, revealing a multifaceted artist. In an interview on Soul, before her soulful rendition of If I Were Your Woman, she shares glimpses of her life, enjoying clean fun like picnics and being a mother of two. Yet amidst this, she emphasizes that she, along with the Pips, is actively involved in crafting their own musical arrangements and backing parts. Despite their groundbreaking contributions, Knight expressed dismay that the Pips' innovative, fast-stepping thing didn't receive due credit. She points out that in the 1950s, they were already experimenting with freeform songs, breaking away from the traditional verse-chorus-verse pop format, songs ahead of their time, reminiscent of what she calls Sly's Bag, indicating a style not yet embraced by the mainstream. Gladys Knight and the Pips' fame, however, is often associated with songs that have become ingrained in our popular consciousness. Midnight Train to Georgia is a prime example. Originally based on Jim Weatherly's song about a woman taking a midnight plane to Houston, the adaptation by Sissy Houston changed the mode of transportation and the destination. Knight and the Pips, inspired by Houston's version, sought to infuse their rendition with a thicker instrumentation and a punchy horn arrangement, akin to Al Green style something moody with a little ride to it, as Knight describes it. Knight's lyrical revision in the song, changing We've Come to Know to He's Come to Know, 
is a masterstroke. It subtly shifts the emotional center, portraying a man whose dreams of stardom didn't materialize and whom she plans to accompany back home to the South. Knight narrates the story emphatically, with Merrill Knight, Patton, and Guest providing key bits of information, acting as conductors and witnesses to her act of witnessing. I'll be with them, Knight sings. I know you will, they sing back. As Gladys Knight embraced the solo spotlight in the 1980s, her journey into the world of music continued to evolve. Now, at the age of 77, she has not only contributed to timeless classics, but also ventured into solo projects, demonstrating her versatility. In the 1985 group mega single That's What Friends Are For, Knight personalized the theme that had begun as a universal appeal on Friendship Train. Her solo career has seen her performing legacy concerts, and she even engaged in captivating Verza's sing-off alongside Patti LaBelle last year. Despite going solo, Knight's connection to her musical roots remains evident. Yet as a figure associated with an ethnic of black excellence, Knight has, at times, displayed more conservative impulses. In 2019, during a time when other black artists declined to perform at the Super Bowl in support of Colin Kaepernick, Knight defended her decision to sing the national anthem, emphasizing the separation of song from acts of protest. Knight's approach to musical activism, however, has always been subtle, if not inscrutable. In the documentary Summer of Soul, her interview provides comments that align with powerful message of progress and pride in black culture. She recalls Motown's emphasis on maintaining integrity and class while acknowledging the importance of the event in Harlem. The dissonance arises when, in the visual representation of the story, the group's airtight performance of I Heard It Through the Grapevine is juxtaposed with offstage moments. The pips raise their fists in a gesture reminiscent of black power, while Gladys waves, creating a subtle but impactful moment of disconnect. These instances of disparity, both within the group and between memory and portrayal, resonate with the essence of soul music. Soul, at its core, is about striving to be authentic while seeking and maintaining connections with one's community. Knight's hand gestures, seemingly those of a performer rather than an activist, convey a unique form of expression, a vocal salute to black power. Gladys Knight's Personal Journey Beyond the stage and spotlight, Gladys Knight's life had been marked by resilience, love, and faith. Let's explore the personal chapters of the iconic Midnight Train to Georgia star. At the young age of 16, Knight faced the challenges of early adulthood, becoming pregnant and marrying musician James Jimmy Newman in 1960. Although the couple had two children, their union was marred by Newman's descent into drug addiction, leading to their separation when Knight was 20. Their son, James Jimmy Gatson Newman III, was born in 1962, followed by her only daughter, Kenya, a year later. The struggles in her first marriage eventually led to divorce in 1973, and Newman passed away a few years later. In 1974, Knight entered into a new chapter of her life by marrying producer Barry Hankerson, uncle to the late singer Aliyah. The couple welcomed a son, Shanga Hankerson, into the world, but their marriage concluded in 1979. Another attempt at matrimony came in 1995 as Knight married motivational speaker Les Brown, but the union ended in divorce in 1997. Knight found enduring love in her fourth marriage to William McDowell in 2001. Despite the challenges of three previous failed marriages, the 78-year-old Empress of Soul attributes the success of her current marriage to her unwavering Christian faith. Knight and McDowell, married for 21 years, prioritized putting God at the center of their relationship, seeking divine guidance in times of difficulty. Knight emphasizes the importance of turning to God, stating, you have to always know that the Lord is going to make a way. We put him first. If you've got a problem and don't know how to do something, you have to look up. That's how we get through. Reflecting on her journey as a mother and a musician, Knight expresses gratitude for the support of her mother, Sarah, who played a crucial role in helping her balance the demands of a musical career while raising her children. She acknowledges her mother's sacrifice, stating, without my mother, I don't think I would have been able to do it. Today, Gladys and William McDowell enjoy the fruits of their enduring love 
with a combined total of 17 grandchildren and 10 great-grandchildren. Knight emphasizes her husband's devotion to their extended family, sharing, When I'm at home, I have a house full of kids, and they're all over William, my husband. He is all about the kids, and they just love him to death. They love him the best, and he will do anything to keep them on the right track. Lifestyle Choices That Will Shock You Gladys Knight's illustrious career is a testament to her enduring greatness, with few singers in the last 50 years matching her unassailable artistry. Here are some highlights from her extraordinary journey, marked by Grammy wins, chart-topping hits, and an impact across various entertainment realms. Knight's artistry knows no bounds, boasting seven Grammy wins and number one hits across pop, gospel, R&B, and adult contemporary genres. Her eighth solo effort, Another Journey, catapulted her to success with hit singles like I Who Have Nothing and the up-tempo track Settle, produced by the acclaimed Randy Jackson. This Grammy-winning collaboration followed her previous success with the album At Last. Not confined to the musical realm, Knight showcased her expertise on the small screen. She lent her musical insights as a judge on the first and second season of Centric's original series Apollo Live alongside judges Doug E. Fresh and Michael Bivens. The legendary songstress provided guidance to contestants vying to jumpstart their careers in the entertainment industry. In a surprising turn, Knight donned her dancing shoes in the spring of 2012, joining the cast of ABC's hit reality competition Dancing with the Stars for season 14. Partnered with Tristan McManus, Knight brought her grace and rhythm to the dance floor, captivating audiences with her versatility. The year 2011 was a pinnacle of recognition for Knight as she both received and extended honors. She participated in a Michael Jackson tribute concert at the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff, Wales, alongside luminaries like Jennifer Hudson, Beyonce, and Smokey Robinson. This memorable event titled Michael Forever paid homage to the legendary King of Pop. Further adding to her accolades, Knight received a Legend Award at the 2011 Soul Train Awards, broadcast by BET. This prestigious recognition, shared with Earth, Wind & Fire, highlighted her enduring impact on the soul music landscape. Cedric the Entertainer hosted the memorable event, celebrating the contributions of these legendary artists. Known as the Empress of Soul, Gladys Knight's impact extends beyond her musical prowess with a significant mark on the Las Vegas entertainment scene and global humanitarian efforts. In the late 2000s, Knight made a triumphant return to the Las Vegas Strip at the famed Tropicana Hotel. Her special engagement ran in the newly formed Gladys Knight Theater, marking her as the first African-American performer to have a venue named after her in Las Vegas. This achievement followed a successful four-year show run at the Flamingo, hailed by the Las Vegas Review Journal as the number one show on the strip. A tireless humanitarian, Knight stands as an iconic supporter of the Boys and Girls Club of America. Her philanthropic contributions include the donation of a Randy Jackson produced song, The Dream, emphasizing her commitment to making a positive impact beyond the stage. Celebrated for her timeless hit Midnight Train to Georgia, Knight assumed the role of national spokesperson and host for Amtrak's National Train Day. The festivities took place in Washington, D.C.'s famed Union Station, aligning her music legacy with the celebration of train travel. In a memorable reunion, Knight joined forces with Elton John, Dionne Warwick, and Stevie Wonder after 25 years. The quartet performed their Grammy-winning song, That's What Friends Are For, at an AIDS research benefit in New York's downtown Cipriani in February 2011. Knight's global adoration was evident as she embarked on a UK tour, performing at packed arenas, including a sold-out show at Wembley Stadium. Knight's fans relished in Before Me, her last major commercial effort paying homage to legendary figures such as Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, Billie Holiday, and Lena Horne. The album also honored those who inspired and influenced Knight through her illustrious career. Her collaboration with the Saints Unified Voices Gospel Choir resulted in a Christmas celebration, featuring holiday classics injected with the choir's unique flavor and definitive soul. Following their debut album's Grammy win for Best Gospel Choir Album, Knight continued to showcase her versatility and musical depth. Adding to her impressive collection of accolades, 
Knight won another Grammy for her duet with the late Ray Charles on his posthumous album, Genius Loves Company 2005. Their duet, Heaven Help Us All, earned the Best Gospel Performance Award. Knight's solo album, At Last, also clinched the Grammy for Best Traditional R&B Vocal Album in 2002, featuring a notable duet with Jamie Foxx, I Wanna Be Loved. Her influence reached the grand stage of the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, where Knight performed This Is Our Time, a song she co-wrote with husband William McDowell. The track was featured on a commemorative Olympic album, showcasing Knight's ability to inspire through her music on a global scale. With a discography boasting over 38 albums, including recent solo endeavors like Good Woman 1991, Just For You 1994, the inspirational Many Different Roads 1999, and At Last 2001, Knight continues to demonstrate her enduring ability to produce hit albums. At Last not only showcased Knight's timeless musicality, but also highlighted her adaptability by collaborating with contemporary producers like Randy Jackson, Gary Brown, James D.C. Williams III, John John, Jamie Jazz, Keith Thomas, Tom Dowd, and Tiger Roberts. The album reaffirmed that Knight possesses the essence needed to create chart-topping records. Beyond her musical contributions, Knight's involvement in creative undertakings, business ventures, and humanitarian activities has garnered widespread recognition. In 1986, she produced and starred in the Cable Ace Award-winning HBO special Sisters in the Name of Love, featuring Dionne Warwick and Patti LaBelle. Knight's acting prowess shone through in the CBS comedy Charlie and Company, where she co-starred with Flip Wilson. Her versatile acting career also included roles in TV shows such as Benson, The Jeffersons, and New York Undercover, along with television films like Pipe Dreams, An Enemy Among Us, and Desperado. Notably, Knight recorded the title theme for the James Bond movie License to Kill in 1989, showcasing her verbal prowess in a different cinematic realm. Her Broadway stint in the musical hit Smokey Joe's Cafe in 1999 further demonstrated her multifaceted talent. In recognition of her immense contributions, Knight earned her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1995. The following year, Gladys Knight and the Pips were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame solidifying their impact on the music landscape. Knight's autobiography, Between Each Line of Pain and Glory, 1997, provided a glimpse into her remarkable journey, drawing inspiration from her million-selling recording Best Thing That Ever Happened to Me. The Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame honored Knight and the Pips with the Lifetime Achievement Award in 1998, and in 2004, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award at the BET Award Ceremony. Knight's commitment to philanthropy and humanitarian causes is as noteworthy as her artistic achievements. She has dedicated her efforts to organizations such as the American Diabetes Association, American Cancer Society, Minority AIDS Project, AMFAR, Crisis Intervention, and the Boys and Girls Club. Recognizing her contributions, Knight has received honors from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, Benai Breath, and BET's Lifetime Achievement Award. Today, Knight oversees her bustling career from Las Vegas, where she balances roles as a wife, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, performer, restaurateur, and businesswoman. Her spiritual outlook, grounded in faith, has been the guiding force behind her numerous successes. Gladys Today. A decade after what was supposed to be her farewell tour, Gladys Knight continues to defy the conventional notion of retirement. At 75, the Empress of Soul proves that age is just a number as she takes the stage in Manchester, exuding a vitality that defies the passing years. The opening number, I've Got to Use My Imagination, sets the tone for a night filled with reasons to keep on keeping on. A soul-stirring rendition of Luther Vandross's Never Too Much becomes a proclamation, I just don't want to stop. While the passage of time may have brought a certain gentleness to her movements, Knight's appearance remains fantastic and her voice, as powerful as ever, justifies her regal moniker. A staggering 58 years since every beat of my heart graced the U.S. charts with Gladys Knight and the Pips, she stands before her audience, visibly relishing the moment. With infectious energy, she playfully remarks, We've been hanging out for uh, many, many years, eliciting laughter from the crowd. Moments later, she teasingly warns, I feel it coming on. Be careful not to hurt yourself. 
The performance seamlessly weaves together the soulful hits of the 70s. Best thing that ever happened to me. Baby, don't change your mind. With contemporary gems like Sam Smith's Stay With Me. Nostalgia takes center stage as she proudly declares that the pips were the first to record I Heard It Through the Grapevine in 1967, playfully adding, and then Marvin Gaye stole it the following year. It's banter infused with admiration, not bitterness, as she describes Gaye as an amazing man. As Gladys Knight graces the stage in Manchester, the tales of her incredible journey unfold. She fondly recalls her shy friend Curtis Mayfield, affectionately calling her Glads, and pays tribute to the losses of Aretha Franklin and Whitney Houston, peers who've left an indelible mark on the world of music. In a touching moment, she reveals that performing allows her to relive the amazing chapters of her life. The emotive performance features the 1989 Bond theme License to Kill, showcasing Knight's extraordinary lower register. A particularly nostalgic rendition of The Way We Were prompts a heartfelt sing-along and a standing ovation. It's evident that, for Gladys Knight, music is not just a profession, but a conduit to revisit a life well-lived. After 90 minutes of soul-stirring melodies, Knight, still note-perfect, playfully quips, I could stay here all night, but I've got to get to the train station, introducing her signature smash, Midnight Train to Georgia. As the curtain falls, she declares, until we meet again. Fast forward to early 2023, and Gladys Knight announces upcoming tour dates, igniting excitement among fans. The Empress of Soul is set to kick off her 12-city tour, starting on January 13th at Silver Legacy Grand Hotel in Reno, Nevada. From there, she'll grace stages in Nashville, Tennessee, Orlando, Florida, Greenville, South Carolina, Albany, Georgia, and more. In an Instagram caption, Knight expresses her anticipation, saying, I can't wait to join you for a phenomenal and soulful evening. Recently honored at the 45th Kennedy Center Honors in Washington, D.C. for her contributions to American culture through the performing arts, Knight's tribute performance featured appearances by Garth Brooks, Mickey Guyton, and Ariana DeBose. Patti LaBelle joined the ensemble for her rendition of That's What Friends Are For, the 1985 cover that raised proceeds for AIDS research and prevention. Can you believe it? Gladys Knight, the Empress of Soul, continues to leave us in awe. If you enjoyed this journey into her shocking life at 80, give us a thumbs up and share your favorite Gladys Knight song in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe for more mind-blowing stories about your favorite icons. Thanks for watching.